Well, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, it's never a struggle to come to Malibu. <laughs> so I'm really glad you hold the Pepperdine Bible Lectures. This is a little up better than Abilene. <laughs> I've been there. And if you don't think that, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> but I like Abilene. It's not Chicago, but I like Abilene. Well, um, I would like to talk with you about uh, the subject of a recent book of mine. Uh, it's called A Fellowship of Difference. It's about the church, about a vision for the church, and how we can implement uh, this vision for the church. I'd like to begin uh, our time together with a brief discussion about uh, how people approach the Christian life. And I want to do this, this is a little bit theoretical, so if you don't like the theory stuff, you can just kind of check out your iPhone for a couple minutes. <laughs> but it sets the context for many of you who are teachers and preachers and pastors, if you use that kind of terminology, and uh, maybe theologians, uh, and, and I think this sets the context for what we're doing. Books about the Apostle Paul rarely and never fully deal with the Christian life. So you get these big books on Paul, and they have a little section on the Christian life. I have a feeling that Paul thought it was a little bit more important than a little section at the end. Christian life books... People who write books about Christian living, spiritual formation, people like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster, rarely, if ever, focus on Paul's vision for the Christian life. In fact, they, they capture him, and I would use the word colonize him. Nearly all books about the Apostle Paul are from what's called the old perspective on Paul, and therefore, the Christian life as understood in these books from the old perspective are entirely captured by individualism. In fact, it sort of goes to an ordo salutis, and that is, they call it the ordo salutis. They talk about calling and regeneration and justification. And the Christian life is captured in one term, sanctification. This is an interesting term. Because when you capture the Christian life with the term sanctification, uh, you're using now a term that Jesus doesn't use. And you're using a term that Paul almost never uses and never uses the way it's used in the Ordo Salutis. And in fact, what Paul focuses on in the Christian life, like the word love, is therefore obliterated or at least colonized by the word sanctification. So I'm deeply concerned about how the old perspective frames the Christian life and therefore reads the Apostle Paul. But I'm in what's called the new perspective, which uh, arises in the 20th century with the great appreciation of Judaism and a, a more accurate understanding of Judaism and how the Apostle Paul fit in that context. My friends who are new perspective scholars, like my teacher Jimmy Dunn, and my friend Tom Wright, who will be here next year. And this, We're announcing Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who, who will do more than fill this room? <laughs> they talk very rarely about the Christian life. And when they do, they'll use big categories like reconciliation or sanctification and then move on to other topics. So I'm deeply concerned about how people are understanding the Christian life. And broader books about the Christian life, uh, if you just go to the Christian life shelf at Barnes & Noble or whatever your bookstores are, there'll be books about social justice and activism. There'll be books about spiritual formation theories and the inner life and how much solitude and prayer and meditation and fasting. And before long, you'll say, you don't even need Paul for this stuff. So I'm concerned about what it means to be biblical. And I know I'm in a good group here to talk about this kind of topic. 
What does it mean to be biblical and talk about what the Christian life looks like? Now, some uh, 10 years ago, I wrote a little book on Jesus called The Jesus Creed. And when I wrote that book, I had a plan that eventually I would write a book on the Christian life on the, in the Apostle Paul. It took me a while to get there. And I often said, when I finish Jesus, I'll move to Paul and I'm in no hurry. Uh, but I got there. And you can't make Paul do what Jesus did. He doesn't talk about the Jesus Creed this way. So you just got to let Paul's understanding of the Christian life flow out. And my book, A Fellowship of Difference, then, is written for lay people. You can use it in your churches. I think you should all buy a copy, whether you read it or not. Uh, it's about how Paul understands the Christian life. And here's, here's the point I'd like you to see today, and this is all you really need to understand from my idea today, and that is this. Paul understands the Christian life as a life in the context of the church. It's an ecclesial life. There is no such thing for the Apostle Paul for a Christian to be a Christian and not to be living primarily in and through a local church. That doesn't exist for the Apostle Paul. But here's what's interesting. Everything about the Apostle Paul's understanding of the Christian life is learning to live in the context of a church. It is almost never individualistic. You can read Paul's letters, and when he gets to the Christian life at the end of his letters, he's talking about things that matter for one another. All right? So, Here's my image for you, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. And I know, uh, as Churches of Christ people, you like stories. So I'm just hoping no one sits behind us. I'd get, I'd get nervous if there are people behind me. Uh, after 28 years of marriage, uh, I learned that I could help in the kitchen. And so I started cooking in my 28th year of marriage, and Chris, my wife, as a psychologist, was very encouraging. <laughs> and she still says to this day that I'm a better cook, and I know this is just reverse psychology, <laughs> and I now have total responsibility for cooking. Well, I like to make salads, and I don't like to make salads the, you know, the way you get them in grocery stores. So here's the way it works. Uh, I buy, we buy all these ingredients. Uh, so this is how you make a salad. You can, uh, you got, you got to have your ingredients. And we believe in things like nuts and berries and cheeses. I like pecorino romano. And we use spinach and arugula. We are so beyond iceberg lettuce. <laughs> It's, it's B.C. in an A.D. world. It belongs with manual typewriters. So, and then and we use um, spinach, charred kale, the solution to all of our physical problems. <laughs> and we use tomatoes and uh, olives, yes. I tasted olives here that I thought were heavenly. They were kingdom olives. And, and, we, and we mix all these things together. Now, there's, there's three ways Americans eat salads. All right? the, the first way is the weird way. This is people from Louisiana. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of hoping no one from Louisiana here. <laughs> or from Indiana, you know. That's, or a Green Bay Packer fan, something like that. So you take all those ingredients and you put them in separate little bowls. All right, so you have a bowl of spinach leaves and a bowl of arugula and a bowl of uh, chard and kale and cabbage and nuts and berries and tomatoes and cheese and olives. This has been big for you to talk about olives. <laughs> okay. right. You Italian, Greek? Si. Yeah. Si. Yeah. All right, so, and you put, them on, you put them in front of you and you eat them. All right, that's, that's the weird way people eat it. All right. Now, here's the American way. You take all those items and you put them in a big silver bowl and you toss them. This is, you, know, you mix them up and toss them. And then you smother it with salad dressing. 
so you don't have to taste the chard and the, and the okay. <laughs> So you put on ranch, or you put on French or Italian, you know, with some cheeses on it and some what? Oil and vinegar. vinegar. No, we're not there yet. <laughs> right. So this is the American way. And now the third way is the right way. And this is the way I do it. <laughs> and that is you mix all these items together, and you put just enough olive oil on it to enhance the taste of each. So you can still taste kale. Now our brother here will never taste kale because all he tastes is ranch dressing. <laughs> is that right? Huh? Italian? That's not the way the Italians do it. I've been there. They, they really don't eat salads. They just make them for Americans who are, <laughs> who are buying Italian grape juice. So, you know what I mean by that, I hope. All right, so now I'm telling you this story for this reason. This is the American church life right now. All right? Uh, arugula mixes with arugula, and only arugula. And purple cabbage only mixes with purple cabbage. And that's called Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. All right? Want me to, want me to dig harder? I, I can, but I, I'll, I'll leave it at that right now. But the reason we do this, in part, is because of this American way of eating a salad, which is uh, the sort of the ecclesiastical way of eating a salad, and that is you can mix all the parts you want together, but we're going to overwhelm it with one taste. That's called denominationalism. All right? I know you're not a denomination, so it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> And it applies to me because I'm Anglican, you know, I'm not wearing that kind of, you know, I'm not wearing my circumcised Baptist tie or anything like that, but that's called a collar. Um, but this is, this is what's happened in so many churches that the only people who are really a part of it or who feel a part of it are people who conform to the taste of the local group or the denomination. And if you don't taste that way, we're going to make sure you do by putting so much salad dressing on that you're going to taste like us. All right. This is sad because this is one option, and it, it works for church growth. But it's not the church of the New Testament. And this should work, but it's because people won't let it do its thing that they do. Now, the third option is that we need the Holy Spirit's oil. Now we got some oil. No vinegar. Vinegar's from the evil one. <laughs> so, that's people who can't handle olive oil. All right? So, the olive oil is the Holy Spirit that enhances the taste of each item. Paul believed that the Christian life was life in a salad bowl. The right kind of salad bowl. He didn't want to see the Jews overwhelming the Gentiles. And he didn't want Jews separated from Gentiles. So he chose the harder option, the third way of bringing these people together. But the church, in the eye of people who look at the Christian life through the new perspective, as I do today, see a church split into factions. Right. We see a church that turns itself into caucuses for causes. And we see churches that are shaped into a Sunday event exclusively designed for a long, long sermon. I'm meddling. Some churches are reframed into a revival service so that it's all about evangelism and a long invitation. Some churches are orchestrated into a concert called worship, often in the key of liturgy and lectionary. And some are structured into nothing other than and not and shaped too much by liturgical memory. So I want to probe 
the way we're looking at the church today, the way the church is operating in the United States, so that I can set this in contrast to how the Apostle Paul understood the Christian life. But remember this. You can't say this often enough. We learn the Christian life in the context of our local church. And our local church shapes the Christian life dramatically and pervasively more than we will admit. Because a church performs the gospel far more than it proclaims the gospel. You learn the Christian life by the context that we, we learn it in. Now, some people learn it individualistically, like C.S. Lewis, and, and you're not C.S. Lewis, and, so we're not, we're not going to go there. But think about this. What happens if the Christian life is understood this way? You'll grow up thinking the only real Christians are kale or fruits and nuts. <laughs> we're in California. I can say that in California. Or if you grow up in this church, you'll learn that if you don't fit in, we'll make you fit in, or you'll have to jump the bowl. All right? But if you learn the Christian life in the third option, you learn that it's really messy, and we need a whole lot of Holy Ghost uh, to make this work well. So some people understand the church as what I would call liturgia, and that is it's primarily about worship and liturgy. So you come to church on Sunday. Understand that that's understood what the church is. A Sunday service characterized by worship and liturgy. For other people, it's ecclesia. And this is the, the great Greek word for church. But often it's formed as a people gathered out from the world. So that it develops a sectarian mentality that we're not like the others. We're very special. We're cliquish. We're elected. And we can develop a theology that will prop us up and make us feel very good about our election. Surely at some point in your life you've wondered what it was like to go to church in the first century. Not in Jerusalem, not in the Galilee, but maybe in Corinth or Ephesus. And think about who was there. Well, Peter Oakes has written about this in a great book called Reading Romans in Pompeii, and he based it all on the demographics of his study of Pompeii. And churches would have met in a villa or in a, a household, and it would have been owned by someone who had enough money to own a household, and therefore everybody in the household would have been part of the church. Right, we won't go there, but it's getting really close to talk about baptism, but I'll leave it alone for a minute. All right, so, so they have these households, and there would be a household owner who was a worker, and he would have had slaves. All of them had slaves, male and female slaves. But there's some Jews who are coming in with this mix as well. And there's male and female, and there's slaves, male and female, and there's household owners, and there's homeless people, and there's people who are dependent upon the household owner, and there are relatives of the household, and they're all mixed together. And what's it like for Shmuley, which is a Jewish a name for Samuel, if you like the guy, Shmuley, Shmuley sitting at table with a female slave, who if she was a female slave would have been owned by her master and available for whatever her master wanted her to be available for and available to whatever her master's friends needed her available for. And you're Shmuley, and she hands you the communion cup. Goodbye, kosher. Right. And what is this about? But this is the real life of a first century church that someone like Paul, who grew up knowing as Jewish that he was a cut above the rest, that's circumcision. <laughs> that's slow. This is, I've, been, I've never been in a group that was that slow. Okay. We're, we're, this is a New Testament group, I am, I'm thinking. That there's, all right, at any rate. What, what's it like for someone like Paul to sit at table or Shmuley 
to sit at table with a slave girl like this and say we're one in Christ. Ooh, that's life in a salad bowl. But that's not what our churches are like today. People who are unclean go somewhere else or don't come at all. Paul's vision for the church, I want to suggest, I like all these terms, liturgia and ecclesia. They're all important terms. I'm not saying one and not the other. But a word that captures more of Paul's vision is the word koinonia. The fellowship, a new kind of fellowship of people who've been brought together to live in sort of a dependence upon one another and a freedom with one another to become all that God had called them to become. So the challenge of us today is to transform our churches marked too much by liturgia and too much by ecclesia into churches more formed by koinonia. And our churches today imitate our culture. We imitate the culture more on Sunday mornings than any time in the rest of our life. Churches of Christ meet with churches of Christ. Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, Anglicans, and Episcopalians, they all meet in their own groups. Sort of like this salad, this way of eating a salad, and it's weird. In God's mind, it's a denial of the gospel. African Americans, fellowship with African Americans. Whites congratulate themselves when African Americans join themselves at the table. Congratulating yourselves is a destruction of what can happen at the table. Asians eat with, eat with Asians. Caucasians with Caucasians. Latin Americans with Latin Americans. The healthy and the wealthy, they have their own churches. And the poor and suffering have their churches. And the young and hip wear skinny jeans <laughs> and sing cool songs. And the middle age wear pleated pants that are far more comfortable <laughs> and right. <laughs> and senior citizens are largely neglected. Married people mix with married people. Single people have to form their own groups and are largely neglected. And widows and widowers are largely ignored. Calvinists meet with Calvinists and Arminians with Arminians and N.T. Wrightians meet with N.T. Wrightians <laughs> and John Pipe, Piperites meet with Piper Cubs. <laughs> and the Charismatics meet with one another and the Formals meet with Formals and the Biblically Curious meet with one another and want to have sermons that are intelligent about the Bible and the active practitioners want to hear something that makes them get up and get fired up and go do something for the betterment of the world. And there are some people who are more pro-women in ministry and others who are not so pro-women. And I have taken a firm stand on this, and I'm right. <laughs> and instrumentals, I understand, versus non-instrumentals is another form. Republicans meet in churches with other Republicans and Democrats. This is the biggest betrayal of the gospel in the United States right now. And, well, I'm not done yet, so don't clap. <laughs> and pro-same-sex marriage people have their own churches, and anti-same-sex marriage have their churches. And it all looks like this, and not like life in a salad bowl filled with the Holy Ghost of the oil of God. So, we have a vision from the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. I used to think this was a passage for liberals. And the more I read the Apostle Paul, the more I think it's at the heart of everything he was all about. He says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, Oh my, what's it like for someone who's a cut above the rest to say it doesn't matter? You know, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. What matters is faith working through love. Wow, 
That's a radical statement by the Apostle Paul. He's come a long way. There is neither slave nor free. Philemon is a brother. He's a brother. He's no longer a slave. Setting the seeds that took 2,000 years for the Western world to implement into something resembling reality. And there is neither male and female, or not male and female, which is a quotation from Genesis chapter 1. This is the beginning of Paul's letters. But toward the end of his life, I think probably in prison, possibly in Rome, Paul has said that we are to be a new people where there is neither Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, and he's expanded his thoughts because of expansion of the ministry and missional contact with people he never thought would be incorporated in the church. There are no barbarians or Scythians. Scythians is probably one of the great first century slurs about people who are unworthy and have no status. And Paul's bringing them all into one fellowship. And he says, Christ is in all, and he is all, neither slave nor free. Paul imagines that his ministry, which he often calls the mystery, hidden from the ages, it's a mystery where God has decided to expand Israel, not junk Israel, not replace Israel, not destroy Israel, but to expand Israel to include Gentiles in the one family of God. He's called this vision. Paul's idea of the church is that it was a fellowship of difference. E-N-T-S, not E-N-C-E. And we have created a fellowship of the sames. In the first bowl and in the second bowl. These are fellowships of the sames. And Paul wants us to understand that there is an inherent diversity to what God is doing. And he loved it. He loved the mess that was created by the church. He loved the challenge. And if you look at Paul's letters, his fruit of the spirit, what's it about? It's not about how you can grow as an individual Christian on a Dallas Willard, Richard Foster retreat. I like these people. Right. It's, that's not what Paul thought was happening. His first fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, love is not about your self-growth. Love is about your capacity to expand yourself to embrace others. And the fruit, the gifts of the Spirit are given not so that you can figure out through some little chart and a little program which is your gift and that you get to own in your church and everybody has to consult you because you have that gift. These gifts are given for the sake of the body. They only work when you're in the context of a church, when you are expanding yourself to participate in the church itself. So the fruit of the Spirit is about others. The gifts of the Spirit is about others because Paul understood the entirety of the Christian life as a, context, as a life in the context of the salad bowl. All right. I want, when I go to 2.15? You really are holding me to a time, time line? I grew up Baptist. <laughs> this is hard. All right, so my proposal... Here's my proposal for each of you. Let's not worry about the preachers and the pastors and the elders and other people doing this. Let's start with you. All right? We're going to start right there. Because this doesn't start at the church level. It starts at your level when you take on the vision of a church that is a fellowship of difference and it's about life in the salad bowl. The first point I'd like to suggest is that we have to develop an intentionality based on our theology. In other words, you must intend in your will and in your heart and mind to become people marked by a fellowship of difference, that you want this. This is hard. We want this until we see what it looks like, and then we revert to this, or we force this. All right? 
Paul wants us to say, I want there to be tension in my church because Jews and Gentiles are not going to eat the same food, but they're going to be at the table together. And males and females are not going to like everything the same. And that's all right. That's what Paul wants. But we will be transcending that through the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit takes our ordinary abilities and transcends them and takes our inabilities and transforms them so that we become what God wants us to be through the grace. So intentionality shaped by our theology. We want a fellowship of difference. Secondly, we have to develop action by active listening. I think one of the biggest problems in the second form is that we do not hear one another well. In this one, we've heard one another so well, we don't want any part of them. Right? We'll just be separate. We'll agree to disagree, and we somehow think that's Christian. We've transcended... We've transcended the Bible to become Western liberal tolerance is what we've done with that one rather than genuine Christian fellowship. So we have to develop an action where we listen to one another. And listening is always, it always goes in two directions. We hear what they're saying so well that we embrace what they're saying as a reality that we need to embrace in fellowship with them so that they can listen to us. You know, there's nothing worse then listen to a theologian uh, or talking to a theologian and they give off the impression they're listening and they're not. You know, they're ready to take you on and turn your view into their view. Listening is genuine listening. So so we need to listen to African Americans and Latin Americans and Asian Americans and males and females and New York Yankee fans. I'm not going to do that. That's for someone else, more full of grace than, my, than I am. Third, here's the challenge. I think that if we are genuinely going to intend and act in a fellowship of difference, we're going to have to learn to share power. We're going to have to learn to share power. This is, has nothing to do with affirmative action. It's life in the spirit where we believe so much in the power of the Spirit and the Lordship of Christ that we believe God can speak to all and through all for the context of the church. But we are going to have to make sure that every voice is heard so that we genuinely represent at the levels of power and structure and authority all people. Fourth, we're going to have to assess how we're doing with truth. And we're going to have to admit that most of our churches are not living up to the gospel today. And we're going to have to tell that truth and name that truth and become people who ourselves are going to work against that non-reality so that we can bring the true reality of the gospel of a fellowship of difference into our living realities. And then the fifth thing is to start all over again and do it again. Because this is never going to end. We're never going to become so good at listening that we've heard everyone. There's always new people to hear. Now, I believe that for this to take place, uh, we need to develop virtues or we need to have certain things that we're good at uh, or growing in. And fundamentally, we have to have the Holy Spirit. All right? And we have to have grace. And I have a section of grace in my book. But I want to talk to you about love in the eight minutes that remain. So I have eight minutes, Mike? Eight minutes, okay. This is the most important thing I have to say, and it's the most challenging thing you're going to ever face in your life. Love is not simple. This is not Beatles-type stuff. It's not even Beach Boys. (laughs) It's Bible. And it's way beyond what the Beach Boys and the Beatles thought they were talking about. What is love? Love is not deep emotional affection for someone. It, It involves that. But that's a, that's a condition of it. Uh, it's a dimension of it, but it's not the reality. We can only understand love as Christians who care about the Bible by listening to what the Bible said when it said God is love. And that means if God is love, we learn what love is by watching God operate. 
And the first thing that God did when he loved his people is he formed a covenant. And so the first point about love, I'm going to make four points about love, and that's this, is that love is a rugged commitment. If I say it's a covenant, you would all agree, and we would not know what we mean. (laughs) It's a religious word. It's, It's the right word that we don't define well. But if you look at the covenant that God made with Israel in the Old Testament, it's anything but a happy-go-lucky, everything works out well. It's a rugged commitment to Israel by God and a less than rugged, less than stellar, not always that good of a commitment by Israel to God. It's a rugged commitment. Hosea might be the best book in the Bible on understanding what a commitment is. It's weird. I mean, it's bad. At times, it's terrible. But this is the the God of the Bible makes a commitment to Israel. And he says, I will be your God and you will be my people, which is covenant commitment. All right. Second, love is a rugged commitment to be with someone. With. It's the principle of presence. In the pages of the Bible, Yahweh is with Israel. First, he's with Abraham smoking pot. Well, that was the wrong accent, (laughs) but it got the college students' attention, all right, in a smoking pot, okay, in Genesis 15, where God goes between. (laughs) I taught college students too long, all right, 17 years. So, um, Yahweh becomes present with Abraham, puts the poor old dude to sleep, And he goes through these animal bits in a smoking pot to symbolize his presence. And then this gives off the image of the presence of Yahweh in Israel, the children of Israel's wandering in a cloud and fire. And then Yahweh is present in the temple and especially in the Ark of the Covenant. And then Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. And that's God with us. And at the end of Revelation, God is going to be with his people. Revelation 21, all right? So it's a commitment to be with. Third, it's a rugged commitment to be with, and it's a commitment to be for someone. For, advocacy. So that that person knows you really want what's best for them. You really are for them. Now this is where the doctrine of tolerance in Western liberal societies breaks down. Because it basically means, I'll be for you, If you'll be for me, I won't mess with your business and you leave my business alone. That's not what the Bible means by advocacy. But I'm going to push this harder. We are called to make a rugged commitment to people to be with them and to be for them. And then finally, fourth, it is unto Christ-likeness. It is a rugged commitment to be with someone, principle of presence, For someone, the principle of advocacy, and fourth, the principle of direction unto Christ-likeness, where we both grow into Christ-likeness. Now, here's something that's really radical and very important. You cannot speak words of untoness until that person knows your foreness. And you cannot speak forness until you have embodied withness. And when you've done withness, people know that you've made a rugged commitment to them. So it works backwards. And I've had many parents who sent their kids to Christian colleges hoping that, they, that I could save their kids. They want untoness but they failed at the foreness and the withness in all the years that they had them. And the kids have told me their stories in my office. All right, so this is a great idea about love. And now here's where it really gets tough. Jesus told you and me to love our enemies, which is wonderful until we spend a little time trying to figure out who our enemies are And we can play this game that we don't actually have any. Until the Holy Spirit turns it on in our life and all of a sudden we go, I know who they are. Now the question is, do you want to be with them? 
Will you embody your presence with them sufficiently so that they will know you are for them and that over time you too can grow together into Christ-likeness? Because this is not one way. You don't get to be unto to someone else without there being an unto for you. So who are your enemies? Who are the people that you don't want in your church? Who are the people that you don't want in your Bible study? Who are the people that you don't want on the elder board? It's time for you and me to embrace the principle of a fellowship of difference by becoming people who love our neighbor as ourselves. And it's a challenge. It's the hardest thing in life. It's easy. It's easy to love people you like. That creates a fellowship of the sames. It's insufferably impossible to love people you don't like. And that's exactly what Paul created us to do, or called us to do. We are called to love one another regardless. All right. I have three minutes here. Uh, In the context of a fellowship of difference, I'm not talking technically about denominations, but local churches. And I would, I would love for local churches to take on this vision one person at a time. But it begins with elders and preachers or pastors and priests. All right, whatever you want to call them. That's where it begins. Because we can create a culture as leaders where we embody this principle that I'm going to get to know the Baptist pastor and the Methodist pastor, and other people in our community, and I'm going to cross the boundaries and demonstrate the reality of love in the Christian life. And I'll close with this. I don't believe in purgatory, but I believe the first hour in heaven is going to be some very serious moments. All right? Where we are going to suddenly realize how we have failed God's call in our lives as groups and as individuals. And in the first hour of heaven, I imagine it to be in California, (laughs) on the beach, or just off the beach, and it's a big cafe, and everybody's finally drinking the drink that they should be drinking, latte. (laughs) None of this drip coffee stuff, all right? So... We'll all be drinking, but we will all be fellowshipping, and we're going to see people that we've been out of sorts with. And at that moment, we will acknowledge our culpability, and we will embrace our accountability, and we will join in an eternal fellowship of song without instrument. (laughs) We won't need them. We won't need them, but I think some of us do need them to bury our voices, all right? So we will join together, and it is our calling to lean into heaven now so that the first hour is smoother, so that the first hour is reflected in all of our hours now that we embrace the fullness of God's people of all time and of all places because God has embraced them And we can do no less than do what God has called us to do. Thank you.